Good day, everyone, and welcome back to Health Issues here at TVUP. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa, dealing with the issues of health today. For this issue, we will be talking to one of our top molecular biology scientists in the country. She will tell us the story of how the Philippine Genome Center and its contribution to the current pandemic has been vital. Let's all welcome our guest, Professor Cynthia Saloma of the Philippine Genome Center. Hi, Cynthia. Hello, good morning, uh, EVP Ted, and thank you very much for having me today. Well, first, let me uh, ask you about your background. How did you get into this field of molecular biology? Oh, the, the story is rather circuitous. Um, originally, my degree was uh, fisheries. I was a recipient of a scholarship in UP Visayas. And then I wanted to, and I finished very early, um, three and a half years, and I wanted to go to grad school. So I was looking for a grad school. But it so happened that I applied to Japan's Amon Bushu scholarship, and I was too young to go to grad school. So I took a molecular biology as a BS degree. And then when I was in, um, um, I cannot go back to fisheries because I already know it at least on the undergrad level. So I went to molecular biology. And then um, it so happened that I was lucky enough to enter one of the oldest, uh, the most pioneering um, department of molecular biology in Japan. And this was in Nagoya University. So it has a genome center in 1967, would you believe? So it was very, very early. And this is really a powerhouse of a lot of biophysicists of Japan. So uh, a lot of the people who discovered, uh, for example, non-muscle actin and the um, Jelsulin system, we really are professors. So I entered uh, Nogoya University as a molecular biologist. And there I entered also a lab that was, uh, which is a developmental biology lab. So our, our, our model system was the mouse. And that's how my journey with uh, mouse genetics and mammalian genetics happened. So um, eventually my professor went to Osaka University and uh, the school or the department I was uh, in is really a powerhouse for immunology research. And this was in the lab of uh, Dr. Taniguchi for the interleukin system. So they wanted to expand to higher systems in complex systems. So they recruited our advisor, my advisor, Dr. Kondo, and the entire lab went from Nagoya University to Osaka University. And this is the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology. And it was a nice campus, new buildings. So I was saying when I entered Nagoya, my building was new. When I entered Osaka, the building was also new. Very, very impressive building. That's an interesting story. And when did you return to the University of the Philippines? Oh, I returned in 1998. Uh, I joined NIMBB. So I had, um, Dr. Ted, I was thinking, where should I go? Should I go to RITM? Should I go to St. Luke's? Because I was looking around for a place where there is robust research. And then I was shopping around and then my husband convinced me Eventually, MBB will become a national institute. So I, I applied to MBB. Actually, I applied to LaSalle. Also, they did not respond. Uh, I applied to LaSalle. Bad for LaSalle. Yeah, wow, bad for them. <laughs> so I applied to LaSalle. They did not respond. Because, you know, when you are graduating from your PhD degree, you try to, to, right. to, to send all your resumes to the different labs. So I went to NIMBB. And uh, it was really, really funny when I was being interviewed because rather than, you know, faculty members interviewing me, it was actually asking them whether they have this equipment, they have this or that, how do I buy, for example, these tubes, etc., etc. because I was already thinking, how am I going to begin a research program in the Philippines? So before I left Japan, I already listed what are the things I needed to start a lab. And it was really, really, I was really, really lucky when I arrived in the Philippines. Uh, and IMBB has a very colored history, and that was a time when many people left in MBB in 1998. So it was essentially very, very, we have very, very few faculty members, but lots of equipment. Some of them were not yet opened. So yeah. We, yeah, we designed our experiments uh, uh, in the laboratory, trying to utilize a lot of equipment in MBB. That was from the, I think it was from uh, World Bank, huh? World Bank Asset Project. So there were a lot of equipment. So we designed our laboratory experiments to test whether we can do RNA in situ hybridization here in the Philippines. And uh, it was, um, it was a, a very nice time in the sense that 
I was uh, I had no children then. I was so busy. I was uh, I was hyperactive, doing a lot of things every weekend. So every Saturday we will go to the to MBB in Albert Hall. That was Albert Hall then. Then we started a mouse lab. Oh, we did not even have proper cages during the time we made our own cages and so on and so forth. But we were also very lucky because. Um, the students are really, really nice. MBB is really like a family. Everybody was supportive. So uh, we were not so many, but eventually we, we crafted the, the, um, the NIMBB uh, as a national institute and it became a national institute. So that's very interesting because many scientists who study abroad and train abroad eventually come back and instead complain they oh, oh, have true. This equipment, they do not have this. I, I like your attitude because you just uh, tried to look for a place where they will do research and would yeah. probably listen to your uh, wishes for equipment. Yeah. And uh, you found yeah. a home at the University of the Correct. Philippines. So tell and me the story of how NIMBB grew, the National Institute for Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. How did it become a national institute? So uh, it, it has been in the works for quite some time. There's really a network of national institutes of molecular biology and biotechnology in the country. But uh, during that time, uh, the one in Diliman was still a program. Okay, so it was still a program. So we had to craft the um, IRR. We have to craft the IRR so that we can have it as a national institute. So there was a committee that was formed. And um, if you said in the beginning, you know, we did not even have our own faculty members. We borrowed faculty members from the College of Science, from biology, from physics, um, from MSI. So eventually with an NIMBB. So, so it, was, uh, it became a national institute under um, executive order number four. And then uh, we, there was some budget. Uh, in the beginning, so we we tried to make do with a budget, and uh, it was really it was really MacGyver in many ways because our laboratories were not really built to be molecular biology laboratories. And, and like at that time, the budgets were yeah, it was like were very hard because we weren't our yeah. money, our economy, the national budget. Yes. you have to fight for your piece of the pie. So how did yeah. you do that? Can you imagine we EVP the budget in the beginning was fifty thousand pesos a year? That was our budget. So you imagine that. So you know how did we do, how did we survive? Uh, we designed our experiments in a way where uh, fifty thousand will work. So for example, our PCR our PCR work is not so expensive, and then um, uh, I even did a lot of RNA in situ whole mount in situ hybridization work. Um, and the question of, you know, a lot of people who studied abroad, because I studied in Japan for 10 years, and a lot of people are really unprepared for the situation when they return to the country. They expect a, a facility or a lab or a building that is already functional and they will just enter. Uh, it did not really happen to us. On the one hand, of course, they were SF equipment. But on the other hand, it is really, really important that you prepare your mind on how to start your own lab. So uh, I wrote the chancellor. Uh, I actually wrote the chancellor asking for a stereo microscope with camera system. <laughs> There's nothing to lose. I requested the chancellor. I wrote a letter. There's no one else doing the work I do. I am go I'm culturing mouse embryos and organ explants, and I need a, um, a okay, camera my system, a stereo microscope with camera system. And I was given half a million pesos to buy that stereo microscope. It was really <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was 498,000 pesos, you know. So I was happy and they can demonstrate how to do operations. Of how can I do a lung explant culture? And, you, and, and the good thing about doing all this cell culture work, of course, there's also molecular biology work, but there is also something beautiful about cell biology is the students can see in culture, for example, an explant of a lung that is... Uh, Pumping, it can do yeah. that. And then you, you see branching morphogenesis every day. And then I also taught the students how to culture, primary culture of um, cardiomyos cardiomyocytes. And they will beat with synchrony, synchronicity in, in the microscope. So it was, and we even made a video out of it. So I was often asked in the beginning, don't I get bored? Because there are a lot of stories of people who came from the US, particularly from the US, who came back to the Philippines and eventually could not stay, stay and then they returned to the U.S. So I think it's really a question of frame of mind because their expectations are that the lab will be ready, 
that everything yes. is ready. Here, it's really a battlefield. If you're going to survive, you have to be very, very innovative. So, for example, because we are experimentalists, uh, AVP10. For example, we cannot even begin doing an experiment unless everything is in front of us. It's not like you are a theoretical mathematician where you can just do computations under the tree. For us who are experimentalists, the culture, the vessel should be there, the disposable material should be there, the media should be there. So it's really very, very careful planning months and years ahead until such time that everything is in front of you and we have to, of course, deal with a procurement system. So, so, so was- not only did you come back with an expertise in molecular biology, the setting trained you to be an administrator of research and buy equipment. Correct. Learning okay. about government policy on yes. how procurement is done, learning about government budgeting system and how, yes, to, get money, yes. and how not to get audited and get correct. The, so, and, so that's, yeah. the, that's actually the hard part. Yes, My, many and, and scientists and, yeah. do not want to do that part, correct? And EVP, a lot of people go through foundations just to cut corners, you know. Uh, we never yeah. did, we never did. We followed all the procurement rules of the university. If it takes three quotations, if it's due, if you need to have this and that, we followed it. So every time, sometimes I hear people complaining about procurement, it's, it does not compare to the procurement we do in MBB. Every day we procure reagents, right. chemicals, and we just have to be battle tested. And it is also very important that we, we train our young people and our junior faculty members of how this is done. So. So a lot of um, conversations were done with uh, also with suppliers because sometimes you remember before, of course we did not have so much budget, but the suppliers will actually collect all the orders and then order three months later. Can you imagine how are we going to survive oh, with that uh, one? The experiments will yeah. be waiting yeah. for waiting, the waiting. so that will not happen. So I talk to a lot of managers and suppliers. Even if I have to pay or we have to pay, for example, for FedEx, we will as long as we can. Um, we can consider the research. That the, the first time is really, really difficult because you don't have a, uh, a warehouse of reagents. You don't have a warehouse of disposable materials. So the first time you do it is really the most difficult. But then we continue years later. It's easy because now you have a battery. You're in your freezers. You have a lot of reagents. And that also... Um, was very, very important, uh, Dr. Ted, when we tried to do the genomic biosurveillance, because when the DOH asked us, we already have the agents ready in our freezers. So, so that's time, one administration. Yeah. Another one that I think will attribute to you is that when I became EVP in February, I got an invitation from a certain professor, Cynthia Saloma, to visit the <laughs> National <laughs> Institutes of Molecular <laughs> Biology and Biotechnology. I think the fact that she realized that the executive vice president of the Philippines was a medical doctor, that I got this invitation. I think you're also good, not only with administration, but doing also the uh, uh, what you, networking. Correct, correct. I think the idea there is <clears throat> if you will mentor young people in science and research, the key is to uh, uh, find out the correct networks, right? Correct. It's so very, very important. That invitation. <laughs> yes. That's a sneaky invitation <laughs> to help you out. Yes, EVP, that was really, really nice. You know, uh, we strategize how oh, we have an EVP who is a medical doctor. And I think it is very important for the university to be able to visit our labs in NIMBB and for them to see what we do. Uh, we are very serious scientists. Of course, we, we always welcome help from the UP administration in terms of equipment, repairs, and so on and so forth. And we were very, very privileged. EVP, I can remember very clearly when you visited NIMBB for the first time, you know, so it was fun. And not many I think people... I was just uh, weeks, weeks into sitting... Yeah, correct, practice. correct, yes. And not many, yeah. Yes, and it I was, was we remember meet. that, we remember that. I was really happy to meet all the people. I was happy and in a way also sad because I've seen laboratories elsewhere. Oh, yes, I've visited yes. National Institutes of Health in the US, in yes. France, and other places. And I saw how cramped you were. You had oh, yeah. in yeah. the corridors. Uh, I saw, you know, you were modifying certain rules because certain labs have to be negative pressure and all that stuff. So I saw how you modified the and you already had a building. That was the, the NIMBB yeah. building. Yeah, true, true. But still, I saw 
that the support of administration was not enough. It was critical, you know, so uh, it was very important for any administrator or any scientist. You really have to engage the administration and you have to make them understand your needs. And the best uh, EVP is really to bring them to your center. We also did that to our vice president for finance. We asked him to visit the institute because we wanted <laughs> we wanted cool. him to see uh, that we yes. needed to have these repairs and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So he was also very happy to be invited to. I, I like that tour because it was a science tour. I, I was entering a job for uh, university administration. But when, when you dragged me to that center, you know, my scientific uh, instincts got uh, stimulated. Yes, <laughs> you yes, remember, yes. I had a lot of questions <laughs> yes. like, the whole morning. Imagine it was just supposed to be a so short visit. Correct. I decided to ask a lot of questions. Yeah, and yeah you, you, sh- you shared with us also your experience as a trauma surgeon, your experience yes. in Malaysia. I remember that one. You know, it was a very nice experience for us. And because, also, yeah. Because they also were doing genome sequencing in Malaysia of all the citizens at that time. Wow. Well, let's, let's transfer now to another topic. And I'd like to ask you about the contributions of NIMBB as a research institute. I mean, what do you think is the most important contribution before so that you got recognized? What contributions did you give for uh, molecular biology in the Philippines into science and technology in the Philippines to education? of this highly specialized field. Yes, um, you know, uh, NIMBB has one of the most uh, stringent criteria for entering the university. So we often get the best and the brightest in the university along, of course, with Intermed. Um, So uh, as far as brain power and commitment and dedication uh, are concerned, we get that from our students. And it is also very, very important for us from the from the faculty side that to be able to nurture all this talent. So that is one. So I think one of the best um, contributions that the Institute has really uh, done is to create this manpower in molecular biology and biotechnology for the Philippines. A lot of our students are working in different labs uh, in the Philippines from RITM to also the pharmaceutical companies. A lot of these are MBB graduates. Also for patents and particular intellectual property, there are also MBB graduates there. And of course for biomedical research, Research at PGH has a lot of MBB graduates. And I think uh, EVP, to a certain extent, a lot of people were wondering um, what will be the job prospects for my for my daughter or for my son if they're going to go into MBB because they were always thinking about the biotech industry and so on and so forth. And if there is any contribution this um, pandemic has shown, it is the critical role of molecular biologists in diagnostics, in molecular detection, and probably in the design of um, therapeutics uh, going forward. So I think for the Philippines, it's really the talent pool that we have created. Uh, we continue to do so. We, in the beginning, we only uh, invite, we only accepted about 35 and 25 will enter. Some of them will go to internet, by the way. So uh, we only had about 25 to 35 students when we moved to the new building. We decided to increase it to 60 because we need to have more people. And EVP, it's not easy to train a molecular biologist. It's very expensive. You need to have also very dedicated faculty members who are willing to nurture young talent. And at, at least for MBB, what we do is the problem of raising funds or looking for equipment is the problem of the advisor. The important thing is for the students to really, really be very, very dedicated into the work that they do and to put their heart into it. So not everyone is given the opportunity to work at the institute and to be mentored by this uh, dedicated team of um, faculty members. And I think it uh, comes out uh, now that we have a lot of a number of graduates who are also contributing to this effort, uh, particularly for uh, COVID uh, testing, by surveillance, and of course, therapeutics, and some for vaccine development. You know, uh, Professor Sinja, I was uh, witness to what you have done in terms of creating the manpower pool. I, I, I lectured about the latter semester of, of that year, the first semester of uh, 2017 to Institute of Biology. And I asked the class, uh, it was a class of about uh, almost 40 students, and I asked them, how many are going to medicine? I think only two or three raised their hands. So I suppose after I visited your center, most of them want to be molecular biologists. You created what what you've done in developing the National Institute 
is that you created an inspiration or a a view. As you said, you created the manpower. There were people who wanted uh, to become molecular biologists like you and the people you worked with. So that's that to me is a very major contribution because we won't have what we have now, like the Philippine Genome Center, the NIMBB, if not for manpower, because people don't realize the machines don't work by themselves. Correct. Right? The, the, the researches won't happen without the, the researchers getting the grants and getting all the money to run the research. So people is very important and you helped a lot. Uh, tell me about how NIMBB helped other molecular biology students from other universities and other researchers. Yes, uh, so uh, NIMBB, when it became a national institute, so we moved to a new facility. And um, we realized also that it is very, very important to create a larger talent pool of uh, experts in molecular biology and biotechnology. So we created a lot of um, outreach programs and also training programs or modules for other schools. Um, in the beginning, we have this biotech facts. We went around the country to help from high school to college students about the fundamentals of molecular biology, just to update them of their uh, talents and skills. And from time to time, we also host um, students doing their research with us and, um, and we act as advisors to a lot of uh, graduate schools in Manila. So, um, you know, molecular biology is a very, uh, it's a very small area. The, the, the expertise, we practically know each other and it is very, very important that we capacitate everyone, uh, not just the state universities, but also private schools, hospitals, and universities about the, the, the concept of molecular biology. Because molecular biology is at the, core of a lot of our research projects. You can be a pharmacist, you can be a chemical engineer, an agricultural person, you can be an infectious disease specialist, but at the very core, the tools of molecular biology cut across all these disciplines. And it is very important that from medtechs to medical doctors to our um, agricultural scientists have the, they need to have the, the grounding about the tools of molecular biology and the power that it could enrich uh, the research projects. Do you remember my question to you? Because I was a, I'm a trauma surgeon and I was asking you about uh, genetic predispositions to survival in major trauma, which were studies of my colleagues, which are papers I was reading and said that, and you told me that could be done. So I need to find a young person. Who will... <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Uh, and you know, because of, you know, in the psyche of people, the, con the word molecular has already entered, right? We have yes. molecular detection, molecular lab. So I think it's, a, it's also very good because you are seeing a lot of interest among young people to pursue careers in molecular biology. I think that's really, really... There are two words there, molecular. And the next word is actually genome. The word genome, genome, genetic. So bring me to the story of how the Philippine Genome Center that you now had uh, was happened. born. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh that's really the uh, uh, if you pick yeah, up the story. <laughs> yeah, the story is really because Dr. Menchit Padilla, Chancellor Menchit Padilla, became was the host of the Asia Pacific um, Hugo Convention in Cebu. So we needed to meet uh, a lot of us, um, mostly female, female, female heads from Dr. Oh, Pina Tibidad, myself, Dr. Kao, uh, Dr. Giselle, and a lot of us, we were together meeting in her house in White Plains for breakfast, trying to, uh, to design uh, what will be the, how are we going to, uh, to implement or how are we going to host that convention in Cebu. It was super, super bonga convention in Cebu. And um, the program, the scientific program was so good. The, 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 the lineup of speakers are so good. And it was then that uh, the chancellor, uh, president, President Roman was there and asked Dr. Menchit, do we have something like this in the Philippines? And, and she said, no. So my goodness, <laughs> we were assigned, we were assigned to craft something similar. So myself, Dr. Um, Menchit Padilla and Dr. Um, uh, Amelia Guevara, 
and Dr. Giselle Concepcion, the four of us, we went around the Asia-Pacific region as well as in the U.S. trying to ask for advice and to observe the genome centers in the different parts of the world. We were also enriched by, uh, with advice from the Filipino diaspora in the U.S. So mm -hmm. we were in Utah. Uh, Dr. Oliveira hosted us. Many people from NIH, Dr. Pedro Jose, Dr. Padlan, they were there in Utah. So we were sitting and we were thinking of what kind of genome center uh, should we make for the Philippines? And of course, we visited Dr. Puro Ganan in New York, um, who also in, um, um, uh, brought us to the National History Museum. And they have a genome center there at the top floor, <laughs> night at the museum. So we realized, wow, they were engaged in um, genome research for these dinosaurs and all these uh, creatures. Uh, from from very very old era and uh they were engaged with it and then of course the, finally we went to the broad institute in, in boston and um they were very very nice uh, of course we also went to baylor they were very nice in helping us um advising us what do we, what should be done what are the challenges of a genome center because you just really cannot make a copy of any genome center you really have to make a genome center that works for your own country so, so that was the origin of it. So we started, it was really, really virtual in the beginning, no equipment, no building, nothing, no staff also. So that was our first uh, executive director was Dr. Amelia Guevara. And then um, she asked me, yeah, yeah, yes. And then the BOR approved a genome center in July 31. Um, and, to, uh, and when you asked me to visit you at the National Institute of Molecular Bio and Biotechnology, you pointed to that will be our new home. <laughs> <laughs> correct, correct. So, so, yeah. so we were able to get grants from the DOST for capacity building in genomics. So the first generation of equipment we had were really because of um, a grant from the PC web. And also that was also the beginning of the bioinformatics store facility. So uh, Dr. Ted, everybody was, be, was very happy when we inaugurated it in our temporary home in MBB the genome center then because sometimes we have so many plans and so many projects and then I then never come to fruition but that one was a functioning uh, DNA sequencing laboratory so we were very happy and we were able to uh, essentially uh, capacitate and um, enrich the research of our researchers can you imagine you about the part of molecular NIMBB and then we have all these labs and we cannot even sequence our own constructs you know the the process we engineer we have to send to Korea to Singapore, to Australia, it does. It should not be that way. Actually, we need very, very fast sequencing, and the only way we can do it is to do it here. So that was really, really important. So we service uh, the genome center service from Mindanao, Visayas, Luzon, and everywhere. And you know, of course, you can send samples abroad, but it's really there's really nothing like being able to talk to us and consult us with your problems and with your proposals, so that you can create a proper budget. So. That's, that advice is free, and that is why we try to help other capacity, other universities, and other researchers to enrich their proposals. So, for example, VPTET, AVP, sometimes we see other uh, proposals and they're only doing this. And then we sometimes suggest to them, why don't you extend your research into this field, into this area? It will really in, in, enrich your uh, project. So, ju you just have to show to them that this can be done, and that if um, if that and then because we are easy to talk to because anyway you are talking to a fellow Filipino on the phone, then or on uh, in email so you can ask the questions you want. So it's still a work in progress, but I think we were able to reach out to many areas around the country, and to show to them that uh, this can be done. And then above, of course the big boost was when we had the Picari uh, the Picari grant. No, the Chad Picari grant. Wow, that was really great, Doctor. Dr. Eva, uh, Eva de La Paz and Dr. Uh, Padilla. Yeah. yeah, that Philippine, was really great. California Advanced, Advanced Research Institute, which gave the Genome Center 360 million for yeah. the equipment that we're now using for the um, genomic by surveillance. So we're capable of doing human genome sequencing uh, several times over with uh, several equipment there. And more than the equipment, we need to have the ability or the of course, in the beginning, the budget to train people. Yes. So EVP, you cannot just import people. We cannot give them the competitive salaries they are used to uh, abroad. Yes. So we really have to train people from the ground up, you know, from sequencing to bioinformatics. 
and it's very very nice and it's really also a privilege for me to be surrounded by young people who are so talented and are practically awake throughout the day <laughs> if you want them to do something they deliver so it's that's really really inspiring yeah. that's a really inspiring story and uh maybe we've run out of time and i'd like you to uh, say a, f- a few words to the viewers so that uh, you can tell them and you can inspire other people there maybe some young person is interested in molecular biology some young scientist wants to develop a lab give them your uh, inspirational words so uh, for the many young people who are uh, interested in science and who believe that they have an aptitude for science i think a career in science and particularly in molecular biology is for you um, there is no other time in history where a career in the life sciences is here we have the tools of molecular biology and genetics in our fingertips and it will really really empower you research and pursuing this kind of work is really um, a really self actualization a process of self actualization because every time you wake up um, you feel energized because you know that your life and your work has meaning and that it has also impact for public health and for our nation's problems and for um, generating new knowledge so for the young people out there please continue believing that you can pursue your dreams and we are also here to mentor you and to help you in the process Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cynthia Saloma, Executive Director of the Philippine Genome Center, our top molecular biologist in the University of the Philippines, <laughs> probably the whole <laughs> if, uh, For the stories you've given us, you have really inspired many people with the work you've done. And not only that, your, your years of work has now contributed to the fight against this pandemic. But ladies and gentlemen, we will tackle that in the next episode of TV Issue. T- TVUP's health issues. This is your host, Dr. Tedder Bosa. Thank you for joining us with the story of Professor Cynthia Saloma.